<laughs> okay. All right. We'll close the order of the cast on Park Board October 17th, 2017. And did everyone have a chance to go over the minutes? I just did, yes. All right. Yes, so. Fair motion to approve. I motion to approve the uh, September 19 minutes. Okay. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? September 2017 minutes approved. All right, down to the new business. Okay. Um, under new business, we're going to talk back on the uh, life jacket policy here for the Castle Aquatic Center. I know that we had bought this issue up, and uh, I know Elizabeth uh, had uh, brought this to our attention, whatever, here during the summer. And then uh, we talked a little bit about it at one meeting, and then um, we kind of left a couple months here. We didn't have a meeting in August. So we're kind of bringing it back up again here to coming back to the to table. Um, basically, I wanted to invite Josh Mitchell and our previous manager, Elena, um, his future bride, but she couldn't make it. So Josh is here, our aquatic <coughs> manager, uh, for discussion on the life jackets being used up at the pool. Um, I felt that he might have more uh, maybe of a different opinion or possibly suggestions or different things that we could work on and to see if we can make a decision or something on the life jackets at the pool. Uh, pools in the area, I did do some calling just to let everybody know and talk to everybody in the cities. Uh, there is a couple pools in the area that do allow life jackets, and that's Owatonna and Wasika. The other ones that don't allow them are Stewartville, Albert Lee, Dodge Center, and us. They don't allow no life jackets at their pools. <coughs> and the reasons why, just to let touch base on, is because uh, the other area pools thought that was more of a babysitting situation with the life jackets. Every one of them told me that. Um, Wasika has a policy um, where you have to be uh, 11, 11 and under can wear life jackets. Oatana's policy is is that uh, they usually use the life jackets for their uh, lazy river. Uh, basically, they have theirs. So, um, with that, let me just take a look on what Wasika wrote on theirs. They um, said, uh, we allow U.S. Coast Guard approved life jackets and floats, but no water rings are allowed. Um, that was their their situation, and Oatana was, um, maybe they were the ones that, uh, that had, uh, they had, yeah, life jackets are permitted in the zero depth area and lazy river area and shallow end of the activity pool. Parents and guardians <coughs> must be in the water no matter what in arm's reach of the child. That's their policy that they don't allow any child at all with a life jacket not accompanied by an adult. So that's basically what their policy is. <coughs> so um, basically I kind of did some research just to kind of let everybody know kind of what the area pools. I do know that uh, Pine Island just approved a new water park, um, a 2.2 million. I talked to the guy up there and they're going to be constructing that here I think in the spring of next year here. So they did approve one. I know the city of Byron is still in the process yet. Um, they're still trying to get uh, uh, what they're going to do for funding and try to get that going, but they're possibly going to maybe possibly put one into in the future. I do know that. So just to let everybody know on that part of it. But with that, <coughs> I thought maybe we could start out and just have Josh come up and talk a little bit. And uh, the reason why i got to have you talk is because I'm going to be recording all this. Yeah, and usually yeah. could be out there, but... <laughs> Jam's gone. gone. <laughs> oh, we gotta have this recorded. That works. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, I wasn't really sure how this would be formatted, so number one on my list was the pool is not a daycare center. Uh, parents should be in the water with their children under the age of five is our rule, uh, and that aids our lifeguards in when they're scanning their area, they know that there's a parent with that small child, whereas when the parent's not within an arm's length of that child, it's, it becomes a, a major focus point and we almost need more coverage in all of the areas of the pool because you're focused more so on that one child. That life, life jacket or not, if that child is unsupervised or swimming away from mom or dad, 
that becomes a focus point because they are that's a trigger for a lifeguard that's something that they notice and they that's something they're watching because that particular swimmer has got a better chance of drowning than maybe the 15 year old that's bobbing with his head a foot and a half above the water okay um, the other things that we have I just got a list of kind of some stuff um, not liking public speaking at all my hands are kind of shaky but I feel the same. <laughs> okay, Josh, you're not in public, so. Well, yeah, right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I even combed my hair tonight. Uh, <laughs> didn't wear my hat. I wasn't sure what the dress code might be. Uh -huh. uh, life jackets are allowed during our tot time, which is from 10.30 to 11.30 every morning. So in that time when the pool isn't as busy, we allow those kids to have their life jacket on. And, it, you know, it gives that we only put one lifeguard out during that time. Parents are expected in the water with those kids. But at the same time, when we only have 30 swimmers in the water and parents can keep really good tabs on their kid, they get a little more freedom to move about the pool a little bit. So that's during that time, we allow life jackets because it is another safety factor because we don't have as many lifeguards on during that morning hour. Um, and it also is to allow that time for those that particular group of swimmers to have their own moment in the pool. So we want it to be a good experience and we want moms and dads to be able to work with kids with buoyancy so they can work on swimming and things like that so they have more room they can do that during that time uh, so we do we do allow the life jackets was my point but we just don't do it we really can't we don't want to have it during our capacity times from at least noon to five because we're looking at anywhere between 200 and 500 swimmers depending on the time, the day, who's there, the weather, obviously all those things have a factor, but um, instead of making, making a number like we can have life jackets when we're under 50 people, we have it so that we have a specified time in the morning when they can be used. And then during the general public time, we do have strict rules on toys, uh, life jackets, all these things that could be potential distractions for our 9 to 11 lifeguards that we have on at the pool at any time. Um, there are days when we hit capacity and we call in additional lifeguards because it helps us cover the pool that we need to cover. Um, but on most normal days, we can get by with our normal station spots. But with another aspect of the life or the life jackets being on, we have to see if they're on correctly because if the life jackets are on upside down because the kid's joking around and he's wearing it like a diaper it turns into a reverse bobber and all of a sudden we have a kid that's upside down takes a deep breath in because he's panicked because he's upside down in the water and we have a drowning emergency immediately so it's another thing that we don't want to have to have on our plate for our lifeguards to watch otherwise we have to staff probably an additional two to three lifeguards every day from noon to four when we're busy. Um, what else do I have on my list? Life jackets open a doorway to all flotation devices, I think, because of the way that a lot of the life jackets are designed. It looks like a cool toy, and maybe they get sick of the life jacket, they take it off, and they start floating on it like it's a, like a backboard. They start floating on it, and now we have a bobbing kid in the water with a life jacket underneath him rather than on top of him. It's just another uh, focal point for these lifeguards that are asked to do so many things at one time to have another thing to watch and say, you know, you got to wear that life jacket correctly or please put that on or go put it back in your um, your bag and stuff. It's just another prompt when they give up to 50 to 100 of them an hour. It's just another ad addition of maybe 20 times where they're going to have to say, there's a life jacket, it's on wrong. Or there's a life jacket and he's playing with it as a toy and it's, uh, and it's distracting the other two kids. And I know I'm kind of delving in a little deep here, but it is a very real possibility that it becomes a toy and it's, you know, it's something that's on the mind of a former lifeguard and a guy that gets to watch on a daily basis how much, how many times these lifeguards have to blow their whistle and honestly how stressed out they are with all the different things that they're watching. It's just another thing on their plate that we don't want. Um, The other example as far as an opening a doorway, if if we allow the flotation or we allow the life jackets all day every day and a parent says, you know, I, f I forgot our, our life jacket on our boat and um, can we use our water wings today? Can we substitute it just for a day? And that's not something we want to have our front desk worker deal with on a multiple occasions and I know it's a, one a once in a lifetime thing or whatever, but 
it's going to happen more more often than we think and we just there's another thing that we looked at uh, Red, Red Cross suggests that uh, life jackets and public pools it's kind of a decision based on your capacity and your space and how much zero depth entry you have and we do have a good space for zero depth entry where we could separate a life jacket only area but um, it all depends on your pool. We wouldn't want life jackets in the deep area because we're looking for a lot, a lot of different things as a lifeguard in the deep area versus the zero depth entry. So, um, <laughs> being a lifeguard is a very tough job, and we want to make I want to make that job as stress free as possible because we're asking 14 to 18 year old kids to do a very stressful job, and many people might disagree with that, but it it's. The fact that we don't have to jump in and save someone is an awesome thing and we never want to cheer for the bad thing, but the problem with that is in the back of your mind as a lifeguard, you're constantly worried about that happening to you and you have to be ready at all times. So we want to make it as stress-free as possible and we want to have those kids be successful and we want to protect our pool as much as we can too. Um, <clears throat> We would have to establish an age limit for, like you talked about, the 11 and under. Uh, it's not a five and under thing then because there are going to be six and seven year old kids that are coming to the pool that might not be as comfortable in the water, but with a life jacket they feel like they can. So we're going to have to establish something like that if we do make the move to allow life jackets. And I think I'm at the end of my list. Hopefully I'm not running too long for you guys, sorry. Do you allow life jackets like to, for family nights and stuff? We do. We also, I forgot about that. We do the mornings and then we also have Friday nights from 6 to 8 o'clock. You can bring any toy you want in. So we generally put two or three more lifeguards on during that time. Make sure it's not too busy and then send them, send a few of the earlier lifeguards that work an earlier shift on. So. When you say 6 to 8 on evening? 6 to 8 on Friday night Friday. is family fun night and we let them bring in any. Uh, actually, we decided to go later. We went into 8.30 on a couple of the nights when it was busy, but I believe we're going to cut it off at 8. Um, yeah, during that time, toys, footballs, noodles, floaties, whatever you can bring in, you can use, and it just, we have a lot of lifeguards on during that time, and if it's not busy, we shift and adjust from there. From 10 to 11 in the mornings? Mm -hmm. Is that every Monday through Friday? 10.30 to 11.30, Monday through Friday, yes. Monday through Friday. And that's still allowed with life jackets? That's, yeah, life jackets, and we're pretty lenient on toys at that time, depending on how many kids we got going on there. Does someone check them, Josh, for that U.S. Coast Guard type thing? Or? Uh, we don't because we we just allow all of the life jackets. I mean, the, we do allow the little puddle jumpers and the little swimmers. They're not the the best flotation device, but they uh, they aid in comfort in the water. So if they are under under the age of five and they feel comfortable with that, little swimmer on, we're still expecting that parent to be with that child at all times, but that's a comfort thing to get that kid in the water. And honestly, there is a lot of people, co or coaches, a lot of parents that coach their kids up and swimming during that time. So we allow whatever, whatever makes you comfortable at that point, so. Anybody got any more questions for Josh? So basically, just, you know, so there are life jackets being allowed now. Uh, in the mornings, yeah. Between 10 and 11, Monday mm -hmm. through Friday, and then family nights. 10, 30, 11, 30. 10, 30, 10, 30 11, 30. 30. Okay. Um, um, so the opportunity is there. It's just not during the peak hours. And I can, I can well, understand that. Yeah. And what I had talked about, too, is just briefly when we got here, is we may look at extending that parent tot hour to our 6 to 8 o'clock times Monday through Thursday if we're only looking at 50 to 100 swimmers at that time and I still have a full staff of lifeguards. We can, we can make that adjustment, I think, pretty seamlessly and allow those tot hour rules to exist during that time. Um, because I think when we're covered with a full, we have full staff coverage and we only have 50 to 100 kids in there, the lifeguards will have a better focus on what's going on and we've gotten a little, we don't want everyone bringing in their toys and things, but if kids ask to play catch with a football in a corner of a pool that's not being used, we've just gotten a little more logical with it at that time, where if it's 7.30 and you're the, you know, one of 30 kids in the pool and you're staying in your own area and you're not going to 
the where the factor that we were worried about isn't a isn't a risk factor anymore because we're worried about that kid getting hit in the side of the face that's just swimming across the pool if there's no one in that area we're kind of it's a situation based for that kind of stuff and I think we can make it such for the life jackets in the evenings and that would be no problem yeah I don't think that would change anything so I would really give it the 10 30 to 11 30 in the morning and the six to eight Monday through Friday as well yeah Monday through Thursday but Money. you also got the family. Well, and then the family night yeah. from six to eight. So it, it becomes, becomes that rule would be from, yeah. There would be five days a week that we could do that. And I, it was something that I talked with Elena about. And I think it would be like a thing that would, wouldn't affect anything about the way that we're running the pool now. And I think we could maybe, op or I don't know how to, we could meet both needs here where we are very worried about peak times when we have 400 kids in the water having life jackets on. And then we can also offer more hours where if you want to bring your kids in with a life jacket, we can let that happen. Now, would you, the Monday through Thursday deal, uh, would that be limited to the zero depth for the life jacket or not? I don't think we'd have to limit it. Um, we would obviously do the same things we do uh, if we have a kid that's not comfortable enough in the water to be going off the high dive, but he feels like he can with his life jacket. We're going to see that one time as a lifeguard, and they're going to step aside and say, you know what? we're not doing the high dive or we're not doing the deep entry right now because you're not swimming strong enough without your life jacket because they you can tell that they can't actually move their body so that's a case by case thing I don't think we would and that's part of it too I don't think we would want to collapse it down and make a you only can stay sorry you only can stay here because I think that becomes another thing where we see the kid with the life jacket jumping in the other way and then we have that lifeguard coming from one corner to the other saying, you know, you can't do that. So, so basically what you're saying in the morning hour from 10.30 to 11.30, implement it only in the zero depth because that's the only thing that's, that's open. That's the only thing that's open at that time, and yeah. And at night time, and at night time just 8 o'clock, it would be open for everybody. Open it for everybody. I yeah. want to just clarify one thing on, on the top time there. Mm -hmm. Now that isn't necessarily... Uh, just a, a life uh, jacket there either, is it? Can they use anything at that time too in that zero depth? We allow like you can six to eight on Friday night. We allow toys during that time, but it's only in one section of the pool, the zero depth. But it's the same way. They same don't rules. Have to have as, yeah, same rules as like a family night. They can bring anything they want. Same as the family. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that's all good information. More I knew more now of when life jackets are allowed. Okay. Um, and I do understand that when you get you know, a hot summer's day between noon and five or noon and four, and you do have full capacity, yep. and you do have wild kids jumping and swimming, and you know the, the importance of safety and how not having that little person, or I don't want to say little because it's not just a little person either, you know, to somebody that's not comfortable swimming. Yeah. I was that kid. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Talk about swimming and can't get your body moving, I was that kid. Okay, um, so, um, but I, I think this gave me some more insight that I didn't know before as we talked mm -hmm. a couple months ago. Well, and I think um, I didn't really mention it because I don't want to make it seem like a parent problem, but the life jacket thing is, the, it's, a, it's a contributing factor to allowing a lot of parents to get just a little more comfortable than they should be yeah. with how scary the situation could be. Mm -hmm. I think it just makes you a little more willing to let your kid get a little further away from you even though you're watching them and then you have an emergency in you know less than five seconds so right. flip over suck in water we got a drowning victim mm -hmm. so we want to avoid that as much as we can and we think that you know perfect world we don't have any distractions but that's not uh, that doesn't work for what we're trying to do there we want to be available to all different types of swimmers all different customers that are coming in that are going to be there for many different reasons but we also have to make sure that we give them a safe place to swim from noon to five. You don't do anything on Saturdays or Sundays to... Uh, Saturdays and Sundays are just noon to eight regular hours. Um, just open. Just open. And we do pool rentals in the morning and when you rent the pool out during the time from nine to noon on a Saturday or Sunday you it's your pool for three hours. You get to bring in your floaties and your toys and your footballs and all of those things. So, um, yeah, there's another opportunity there to find time to bring awesome. in those things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anything so, else? how many kids are we talking like in tot time? Uh, on, we can be at, well, depending on the weather, but yeah. you know, you, ten kids on a honestly ten people on a cold the coldest rainy day you can imagine they'll be there. There'll be ten fat or 
five to ten families, so that becomes 20 people. But we can look between just people in the water. If we include the adults, like there's going to be, there can be 20 to 50 would be a good number. How many of kids have life jackets then? Uh, half of them. Half of them. Well, family night. It's hit or miss if the kids like their life jackets, they're wearing them, but it's more so the toys on family night. They like to bring in their big slice of pizza that they can hop on and all those things. So it's hard to tell, like, how many, but we're looking at 20 to 50 people. We've had some busier days where it's 100 people and we call in another lifeguard and things, but that's what your average 1030 to 1130 looks like. But kids with life jackets aren't that many. Yeah, no. Okay. Those, I mean, the people that are using the life jackets are very... They're, they're not comfortable in the water and they need that life jacket and those are the people that we're trying to keep out of the water during those peak times when they're going to be bobbing at the surface of the water when there's 30 people around them. So. Alright. Great. Okay. Anything else? Mm -mm. Thanks Josh. Oh, that was Josh. Good. Yeah, thanks Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth, did you want to sure. talk a little bit? Sure. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. All right. I don't like public speaking either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not in public. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I just jotted down a couple notes because, um, but uh, but first, um, I printed off a couple things about life jackets and pools. Um, and I don't know if you ever read the original letter I wrote, but um, I am just passionate about water safety and teaching um, kids to swim and providing the safest environment for children um, in the pool. And uh, I've seen a death of a four-year-old boy in a pool uh, affect the community. And I, you know, I, like at this point, my kids are fully swimming on their own without life jackets. So I don't, this isn't even about my kids being able to go to the pool and wear a life jacket. Uh, it's about other people's kids and our community. Um, and um, it's, so like my son, a lot of Friday nights over summer, he was wearing a life jacket for family fun night because he is a daredevil. He is extremely comfortable in the water. He's been in swim lessons since he was six months old. But he's also like, I'm watching him like a hawk, but he's the kind of kid that'll get away from you really quickly. And I have two kids, and I think that's a common thing with a lot of moms and cats, and is you have more than one kid. And the fact that they can't wear a life jacket is turning away some people from being, like even going to the pool because they're like, it's so hard for me to watch my second child, even though he's a strong swimmer, because I can't even let go of this one. And, you know, it's just, it's scary as a parent. And I, I over the summer, I, there was a little girl that had gone down in the zero depth and she got to right by that rope for where it gets to the deeper area. And nobody was seeing her, nobody, her, she had gotten around her mom. It, I, I understand it's a, it's a rule, parents have to watch their child. But at the end of the day, like, she was under the water, nobody saw her. I grabbed her out of the water and it just, you know, it just can happen so quickly. And it just takes minutes for there to be, a drowning for there to be damage, brain damage. Um, so I think I just think it should be the parent's choice if they want to have that extra layer of protection for their child. Um, I, I'm I am the parent that's like excessively watching my child, but I'm also watching other people's children since I have worked in a pool and I it just it's very stressful and it is very chaotic. Um, but I did look up like CDC and American Red Cross guidelines on it. Um, and I can pass these around if you want, but for CDC for drowning prevention, it said make sure kids are wearing life jackets in and around natural bodies of water, even if they know how to swim. Life jackets can be used in and around pools for weaker swimmers too. And then for American Red Cross, they had like this little flyer that was life jackets aren't just boats, or aren't just for boats. Um, and it, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> okay, I've emailed that to you too. Um, young children and weak swimmers should wear life jackets whenever they are in or around water, even at a pool or water park. Um, which is something that, you know, I my experience was in the Y, I know in San Diego, but the Y in Rochester also provides Coast Guard approved life jackets. Um, I've been to Wisconsin Dells, to Treasure Island, to different hotels, different water parks. Uh, Blooming Prairie is another community pool that they do allow life jackets at and most of them are providing life jackets at it. Um, um, so, uh, I completely understand being a lifeguard is a stressful job and I, um, I actually like, I think 
in talking about this, I always say, like, I feel bad for those teenagers that are lifeguarding. Like, it is stressful there. There's a lot going on, and it does seem very chaotic during those peak times. Um, and that's what kind of pushed me to feel like, I feel like, as a parent, I want that choice during this chaotic time, and there's kids jumping and kids bumping into them, and I want to be able to give that extra protection to my child. Um, I strongly believe that parents still need to be in arm's reach always, and this needs to be enforced. This needs to be enforced whether or not the child has a life jacket on. A parent needs to be in arm's reach. Um, I think something that I would love to see more of is more swim lessons available. Um, because when we moved here, it was you know my son was three years old, and he was really too old for the parent swim lesson, but he's too short for the older kids swim lesson, so then it was like, what do I do with him? You know, like, I, I had to look somewhere else to continue him in swim lessons, um, but I think that's a big thing that could help with swimming and people in our, with kids in our community. Um, the tot time is just unfortunately not feasible for me because of my work schedule, uh, but we did go to, like, all the family fun nights because that was, like, they were so excited. My son was so excited he could wear his life jacket and do everything then. Um, so for me, it's like I was still, there There are a lot of parents that are still going to be keeping close watch on their kids, even if they have a life jacket on. And unfortunately, there are parents in our community that aren't watching their children, whether or not they have a life jacket on. I see it every time I'm at the pool, and I <laughs> I want to tell them to watch their children. But, uh, you know, I think it's going to happen whether or not you have a life jacket on. And at the end of the day, I would rather have a life jacket on that child whose parent isn't watching them. Um, And the puddle jumper life jackets, those are actually Coast Guard approved. And my, that's like, I see those at different water parks and pools a lot, and they seem to really help kids. And they actually, I really think that helped my son build his confidence. And by the middle of the summer, he was like, I don't want that anymore. And he's a pretty good swimmer now. But um, I think also the babysitting service, I just feel like a lot of that maybe could be because there's kids there that don't have parents with them there's you know like there's not an age limit for when kids can go in by themselves i think that is a big problem causing a babysitting service that's not my issue that i'm bringing up but i just like even today i saw on the Catholic library that they won't allow kids to come in unless if there's kids under 12 years old they can't be there without somebody at least 16 years old and i was just like i'm really surprised the library has this rule but we're not seeing this rule at the pool so sorry to open a new can of worms. <laughs> I'm just trying to help um, prevent drownings in our community. And uh, I, I meet a lot of moms. I see them on our Cass and Manorville moms group talk about how they wish they could wear life jackets at the pool. And I just want to give those people a voice. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Right. Any questions? With, with you, do you, you think having uh, so six to eight more nights a week would, would help out? I think it's helpful, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm that's, happy. That's something I can see that we're trying to help Like a step sides. in the right direction, to, yeah. You know, I can see their their side of it being hectic right. like it is, and I think you can probably see yeah. that side of it. And in another way, I see, well, you'd think it'd be safer if kids had life jackets on, but they don't see it that way, and I guess they're the ones that are there every day, you know. So right. we, I'm, I'm trying to just listen yeah. to both sides and come up with something fair for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that adding that six to eight o'clock, you know, mm -hmm. Monday through Thursday would give more people opportunities because a lot of people do, like you said, Elizabeth, work schedule kills mm -hmm. a lot of people from not coming or bringing their child to the pool yeah. because they're working during the day. Yeah, and so the other thing was I think there was an age limit, like that you couldn't have older kids there during parent talk time mm -hmm. because I have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, so it was like mm -hmm. I can't, you know, my eight-year-old wants to go to the pool too. We charge per child. Are over eight or nine, they can come in. And they just view it as another super or another chaperone to the younger child for the tot aspect of yeah. things. Yeah, but then they can only go to that pool. Right? Yep, they yep. can't go to the other one because we don't have the, the yeah. coverage until we don't yeah. have coverage until noon yeah. for the peak times. <coughs> well, sounds good. Um, I think we got a couple members here missing. Actually, three members are missing on our panel today. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't help matters. And I think what we'll probably end up doing is still probably bringing this back up here next month and 
maybe just discussing this a little bit and deciding, trying to make a decision what we're going to do, um, you know, for the coming year. I want to try to get this figured out as soon as we can, because then I've got to pre-plan. We got to put everything into the, put it on our website, and we got to let everybody know how or what we're going to do. If it's going to be added to six to eight or whatever. So um, with them guys not being here, I think we should as a we should allow them to have their mm -hmm. voice and see what they want to say about it too, you know. And make sure they should be able to listen to whatever was said here. You yep. know, I think it's, it's important to hear both sides of that too for, for everybody else. Yeah, we'll so just you have them yeah. go through it. And uh, I think that's only fair as far mm -hmm. as I agree. making a decision. Sure. I, I agree. Yeah. And I think we you know just we should briefly just comment around the board, you know, kind of our thoughts tonight, at least I will mm -hmm. myself. Um, knowing that we have some opportunity for life jackets in the morning from 10.30 to 11.30. Um, I like the idea not just having the uh, the family night on Friday night from 6 to 8, but opening it up from Monday through Thursday as well. That gives you five days a week in the morning and five days a week in the evening uh, to have the child or parent or both. I just thought, sorry, I, nope, I just ahead. thought of, as you said that, there's not a whole lot keeping us from turning that lifeguard time, or lifeguard, I keep saying that, life jacket time, um, into Saturday and Sunday as well from that six to eight time. Yeah, I was just um, that might as well. I, yeah, I didn't even think about that, but that, that is. And, th and that was my question on Saturday and Sunday, what do you do? Because sometimes the weekends, you know, it's the weekday yep. parents work, but now I got the weekend free, so let's go to the pool, but let's go in the evening because I can use a life jacket. So that would be another extension as well uh, yeah. to consider. But um, so I like the idea to help compensate, um, you know, I'm going to call it the weak swimmer. Okay, and I enter, and I, I, I don't understand because I'm not a parent that has two kids that I want to take them both. One's a weak swimmer, one's not. How do you watch them both? Unfortunately, that's not a, li a lifeguard responsibility who's between the age of 14 and 17 or 18 because you can't put that on a, on a kid like that. Um, and if the parents that I need to bring my friend with who's an adult to help watch my kid, it's always a say, and not say around, but the two moms or the mom and the dad both got to go. You watch this one, I'll watch that one. Unfortunately, that's part of having kids, and it's like having two different sports. Who goes where, and how do you make it work? But um, to put the stress on lifeguards, as you just said, t talked about yourself, uh, <coughs> the stress put on a 14, 15, 16, or just the lifeguards around that are constantly watching, what if something does happen on their watch? And we've had it, and fortunately, we've had some success of uh, saving people and, and, and preventing accidents, but. Um, you never want to have that one accident. So, you know, I don't want to call it a, a babysitting situation because it kind of is, but whether they're 21 years old or 15 years old or 4 years old, it's still a lifeguard in general is overseeing, which is watching, which is babysitting. Not saying baby's the right term, it's not. But swimmer sitting. Swimmer sitting. <laughs> so it's, it's not about uh, something that's. It's, it could be something we bump their head and not realize it, and all of a sudden they get a little dizzy and tip over. Mm -hmm. you know, the kid's not going to say, I bump my head now, I'm going to go sit in the chair. No, I'm going to keep swimming because my buddies are swimming with me as well. So, um, But the idea of Monday through Friday, morning and evening, or opening up for Saturday, or um, you know, I think that would greatly compensate uh, kind of where we're going. And you can't make a full blown decision to go all out right away. Obviously, you have to see how things work out. And the other side of the staffing the pool, um, there are budgets and there is a how do you put more lifeguards on. And these people want jobs and if also it's like it's a cold, cloudy day, you know, these kids are, or adults or however you have the lifeguards, the staff, they want to work. But at some point you can be overstaffed. So who doesn't get their job? So there's that happy medium in a business situation mm -hmm. um, to where if we had a budget that could say you could have 15 lifeguards are on there all the time, and it passes the budget, and we're making money. We're not there though. Um, but I like, like I said, you know, the opportunity to, to expand. It's not like we're not allowing life check. It's just the peak season or the peak time when you have aggressive swimmers and jumpers and lots going on. It's unfortunately will cause some people to stay home to where it's going to be. You know, now you can bring some toys, life jackets, and a little more comfortable and being with the week. So I think we I think we got a good step so far.
I'm in, yeah, and that's what I was going to say too, is that adding the family fun night from 6 to 8 is, would be beneficial, because a lot of parents, yeah, you are at work during the day, and that's, and, and with, for the lifeguard sake of it, there is a ton of daycare kids without parents there, they're with the daycare, the daycare can't keep track of all of them, obviously, and all just the young kids that come during the day, and I don't know, my opinion is I feel even if somebody did have a life jacket, I don't care how old, there's just so many kids, and yeah, I just feel that the six to eight is an awesome idea. As being the park and rec director, I've been up there pretty much every day too, and Josh knows that. My biggest concern is what kind of what Liza touched on. Um, I think everything that Greg said is absolutely yeah, true. Right. Um, but Liza, Liza made a valid point. We have, just like kids, we have uh -huh. uh, project kids. We have uh, two or three buses that come in with 150 kids at a time mm -hmm. during peak swim hours. And to have them and have everything all congested from noon until would be to me I just assume not have that period where we have to deal with that we're very busy sometimes when we do have peak we got people standing out line until one leaves one can come back in um, the concession stand it's, it's, it's really quite a system up there and I know as a lifeguard and as a manager and as a park and rec guy we deal with a lot of issues um, good things and complaining things it, it comes with all the whole thing. So I think, like Josh was making the point, you know, less, you know, chaotic things that are happening up there, I think, during the peak hours of noon to five, I would feel much better mm -hmm. um, being in charge of the whole thing with not having that. But I definitely agree. Um, talking to some of, some of the other people here, like the lady Sarah McKay over in West, uh, Wasika, that has been a great thing for them at the times when they allow life jackets, they said, uh, uh, and they do it in a controlled atmosphere, you know, they got certain areas of the pool that they allow it, you know, and um, they haven't had any problems in the last five years since they've opened up. They opened up, I think, in 2007 or something like that, their new uh, water park in Washington, so, um, but that's kind of what I wanted to say, you know, we do have a lot of people coming from other towns that are use our facility, you know, and that's one about thing about peak hours for me. Yeah. I think all three of you took the words out of my mouth. You said just about everything I've thought, you know, to say. So I'm good with. It. I guess I got a little ahead of what I kind of said what I wanted to say at the right. beginning. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfect. No. Yeah. yeah. So I think what we'll do is, I mean, if that's just everything's wait. okay, you know, I think mm -hmm. when the other ones come back and they get an opportunity to, to look over and review the tape and they can, and then we'll... I think it's important just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, if we do move forward with the six to eight, the family fun night aspect of things, we might have to find a way to... Um, the toys is, is an issue. If we're really busy, I think we might have to make a rule about like projectile toys. Uh, I've seen rules like that at the pool. I don't, my mind's racing as we're all talking here, but I'm just thinking in the future, it could be floaties and life jackets, but we might have to make a no football, stipulation, football, no footballs yeah. and things balls. like that because mm -hmm. okay. it would be just a, a rough Saturday or a rough any evening at, at 7.30, some kid gets hit in the ear with a football because we're too busy and yeah. we allow right. it at the wrong time. That's point. And that's something you can right. post right on the wall. Over yep. 50 people, nothing that you can throw, you know. Right. Right. Or at any time yeah. lifeguards can say, right. you know, all yeah. throwable toys or stuff are toys at lifeguard discretion would be a really easy way to do it because yeah. if we do have 150 kids in the water at that 6 o'clock hour on a Thursday and they want to bring out that big slice of pizza, right. they might say, you know, we can't have that because there's too much space underneath that floaty that I can't see. But, right if, but if there's 30 people? But, it, yeah, if they're okay with it because they can see everybody in the water, I mean, like you said, opening a can of worms, we, we can talk about bettering all of our rules at any time. We just got to make sure we're set on what's allowed and when, if we make right. that change. Right, right. So. <coughs> right. Sounds good. So, <coughs> I think Perfect. we've heard everything. I appreciate Elizabeth and your 
Heather. 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 <laughs> Josh too, and like I said, we'll get this thing hopefully buttoned up next month, and we can go from there. Does that sound okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. So. Yep. How are you guys doing? Okay. How is? Twenty minutes maybe. There's not a lot. There's not a lot left on that. I'm gonna just if you want to let uh, Jan is gone, but if you want to let Nancy know, I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna go back and grab that paperwork, and I'm just gonna drop it in the box tonight. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks Josh. Thanks, Josh. Josh. Okay. Hey. Talking a little bit quick, like here before the pool. Oh, this okay. is our our post bulletin leader choice cho choice award mm -hmm. plaque that I'll make it a bigger plaque and wooden plaque that we'll get on here. But Perfect. voted the most the favorite swimming pool in Southeast Minnesota. Anywhere? Where's our paper? You know. <laughs> I think we. Yeah, it was in the post PCI. bulletin. Yeah, and but PCI. It was it yeah. Yeah, it's I probably don't see anything it was all taken. Mm -hmm. September 30th, there, there was an ad in the back of Post Bulletin and everything else. That <laughs> I missed it. This is our first award. <laughs> on that day, day. It's, a, it's, a, it's a Reader Choice Award for like best restaurant, uh, yeah. all kinds of things in Rochester. And we were awarded the favorite swimming pool, which was pretty That's good. Cool. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll get that and I'll put that in a little bit bigger frame and I'll hang that right up next to our plaque that we put up. At the end of the year, we got that plaque, by the way, put up in our oh, yeah. aquatic center now. Cool. So when the construction was, so sure. just wanted to let everybody know about that. Okay. Nice. Okay. Perfect. I, I can't find nothing in that damn paper, so <laughs> should have been in there 20 times and you can't find it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So <laughs> move down to cemetery. I'm going to mute myself. Then. I talk about yep. it. So. Cemetery oh, fence. Uh, Okay, uh, we've been, if anybody hasn't drove out there, I have. out there by the cemetery, it's changed a lot. Looks good. Uh, we've taken down nine trees, um, grinding the stumps, and we put dirt in them. Um, we took out the cement pillars, um, and then uh, hauled in uh, four loads of pulverized dirt we did, and took out all the cement where the old fence is in underneath the ground. I mean, there was some cement things like that. That was never going to move, I don't think, in a hurricane, I don't think, mm. for that fence anyway. But anyway, we got them all dug out with a backhoe, and then we put dirt back in and filled it all in. Um, and then, like I said, Justin Dino came and uh, put in the four pillars at $8,660 uh, for four pillars. Um, they look really nice. Um, I really like to add two more on the ends by the vault and then down on the end way on the end of the west side. Uh, but to dig the footings and then put the pillars in there are like $3,600 each each one. Yeah. So if we're going to do and add, add a couple more at the end, which we can down the road, um, I think it would look a lot nicer if we had ones on the end too because then the black fence would be in, our, in between all the pillars, you know what I'm saying? Right. But anyway, um, that might come in the future. But still, it looks nice. Um, the monumental fence was ordered. Um, we went with uh, Majestic Plus. Um, it's the high grade, um, commercial type grade fence. I think uh, the price ended up being around 23000 I think, for the fence alone. Uh, it took three weeks to get it made. I think it's getting made out in the East Coast. And Midwest Fence from St. Paul will come up and put it in here at the end of this month or the first week in November. So that, that fence will be all done. So what we did for improvements out there, um, I think it really looked nice. So it was basically totaling between the fence and the, you know, we're looking at around thirty-one, thirty-two thousand dollars to to redo everything out there. But we did get the old maple trees down, and uh, that looks good. And uh, so I, I actually I think the cemetery is uh, is looking a lot better. So just to let everybody know about the fence. Does it look sharp? We'll just go on and shoot that dirt, and then uh, we'll reshoot it again, aerate it in the spring, and then uh, get that grass to grow so that it looks a lot nicer. So just let everybody know on that part. Is there is there any uh, thoughts? Are you planning on putting more maple in at some point? Or? Um, you know, out on the boulevard, I want to see what all happens. I mean, we have that right away where we can still stick it in between the, the curb and the fence, you yeah. know? Um, we have lined the outside, the west side, and we're do, going to do the south side. And it is Maple Grove Cemetery. I like to have maples. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? There's a lot of old maples still inside the cemetery where we're going to need help probably.
Howie from Corey Olson's crew. Um, they got eventually you got to budget some money to take them down. They're terrible. Some of them are in bad, bad shape. So next thing you know, what we'll have left is probably just a few pine trees and some arborvitaes left when it's all said and done. Mm -hmm. You know, but the nice maples will line the outside of the whole cemetery, mm -hmm. which I think will look nice. But um, but yeah, that's a great. So all of them are that center road. The ones along that are. They're bad. They're bad. Yeah, I always, when we get the winds and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, we're picking up branches and stuff all the time out there, so. And there's so no place for them to fall if they don't wreck something. They wreck That's something. That's the bad thing. Yep, yeah. and then we end up paying for everything, you know, so. So anyway, yeah, that's the update of the cemetery. I think it looks really nice. Okay. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. just golf course. Um, disc golf course, which is really kind of the good thing that uh, I found out that I was looking through, for some reason I was looking through some stuff I needed to uh, find out some questions on the, for the school and I looked and I seen Jared Pittman's name and he was the guy um, that helped design our Frisbee golf course down when, you know, before shop would come. Yeah, yeah. And he came back to the school. He had moved yeah. away and he came back and now he's a physics teacher and he's also the cross country coach and track coach. So I gave him an email and told him what our situation down there was. And we'd like to uh, put a Frisbee golf course in, in you know, the 17 acres down there. So he actually was out there a couple weeks ago with his track cross country people doing some running out there. And he definitely said, yeah, that he would love to help design a new course. Mm -hmm. But basically the course he said would probably be the area that we have is only gonna be good for about a nine hole course. 17 acres, he says, because on a really good course, you have so many pars and you have so much di distance between each basket and each each uh, tee. So he said a nine-hole course would be best because you got to figure about an acre and a half per basket per hole. So when you start breaking that 17 acres down, and the woods and the creek and stuff, we're down to about 13 acres or less 12 acres. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to set up a nine-hole course. Um, where it's going to start, you know, on the south side by the highway, because we're going to put that parking lot off in, where people will pull in there, you know, and they'll park, go to the first basket, and then they'll walk on the snowmobile bridge and go to the bigger part, and then end up, hole number nine will still come back by the bridge and still end up by the parking lot. So, cool. you know, they can just kind of keep So it goes into the south down. side, start, start and stop. And, and ends in the south side, hole number nine. Number one and number nine for sure will be at the south side. So then if they want to play 18, they just go back to number one and keep right on going. Yeah. So basically, I got some maps. Me and Linda kind of got on uh, Google and we got on some of our GIS maps and we're, I got the whole outlet because I'm going to drop it off to the school and he's going to look at it because him getting here now until winter might be impossible. He told me to, to walk it. You know, he don't get done with coaching till 5.30, 6 o'clock, and it's dark and stuff like that. So he says him and his wife might be able to, if I get him a mat, him and his wife might uh, walk up on a Saturday or come up on a Saturday, Sunday, and just kind of walk it and just take a look at it. So he's going to help us out on that part. But anyway, he loved the idea that uh, we got 16 trees that are going to get planted too. Once we get the baskets in, we got 16 trees budgeted, you know, 4,000 to put them in got them picked out to J out at Jason Wilker's landscaping. They're big ball and burlap trees. We're looking at about five to seven year old trees, which are nice. And then uh, we did put in the budget again for another 4,000 to get another 16. So I think we're between 30 some trees, we're gonna have some nice uh, trees in that area and look a lot nicer and obstacles to throw the Frisbee golf around, Frisbee disc around. So basically that's in the process and um, Hopefully we can get the baskets in before frost comes in. That's what our plan is. And plus get the trees put in. That's what we're praying here. Get a couple good, more, two, three more weeks of good weather and I think we should be able to get it. So that's next on our, our slate to get done is trying to get this Frisbee golf thing going. So good. Awesome. You think it came back at a better time? No, it was great. I couldn't believe awesome. it. I seen his name. I'm going, oh my gosh, is that the same guy? So that's <laughs> like all my old records. That's him. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. So it was good. He, so he, by the way, if you don't know him, he competed in the national the world championships frisbee golf. He's a ch world champion. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He's went all over the United States and played frisbee golf. Yeah. Tell him not to make it too tough, though. 
Yeah. yeah. So Greg can play. <laughs> <laughs> I used to play down Lake Winona. Yeah. Uh, and course around there. Yeah. And I think that's kind and of. And I'm going to make them swim across the creek. I was just going to say that. Yeah. No right. water for Greg. I can get all the stuff that's from the bottom of the creek out. So that's where I'll be used to. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, good. Good. Sounds good. So really, we're looking at it'll be a nine hole, nine, nine hole course versus 18. Yep. And um, if they want to go 18, they would just have to restart over and go yeah. on through that. I don't think that's this is no problem. I can't see. No. Plus, we got nine bachelors already. Well, if, you, yeah, if you look back, I don't know how mm -hmm. many people are on the board, but all that shrapnel, marsh, crappy tree. Remember one point, the fire department tried burning that off to clear it, which yep. I think we were thinking at that point we can use this part of the parkland, the city land for Frisbee golf at that point, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as we start talking about. But now we'll take the there. few remaining bastards that are in that old part and we'll pull them out and that won't be any part this of the This is going to take care of the Judy reports. This will keep, take care of Judy. We won't be behind her house or anything. And Perfect. It'll be fine. So, oh. mm -hmm. what, are we, what are we going to do with that area then? Where hole one, two, where? Let's say by the cross by the car wash. Car wash, we'll just... We'll just is that just going to be grass? I mean, I mean, we'll not stay. saying it's going to be a you know, city-owned property and what are you going to put there? And right. The, Right. We'll let somebody else bring it up. Right. So I shouldn't mention that. So strike, no. strike from the record at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Rewind. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Okay, down to the dis or sorry, the old business. Yep, old business. Our I kind of want to quick go through a few things here, um, so you guys know what's going on. We have uh, some things you have to do here. First of all, like I said, uh, the frisbee golf course. Uh, we need to hopefully put our baskets and get the trees in. Um, West Park, the old West Park, we call it the J. Hyde Cassin Park. Um, we need to dig out the infield and make that bigger, move home plate up 20 feet, haul in egg lime, which I got uh, guys coming from Elk River dumping the lime already. Um, reshape the infield, put in new anchors for the bases. Midwest fence is going to be down, at the, like I say, at the end of the month here. Uh, they're going to do all these fence projects and they're going to move the back, backstop up 20 feet. So then we can be able to start hauling fill in to make that bank and fill that all in and make it more maintenance friendly. We got a uh, whole pile of fill out behind the wastewater plant. We got, we got some black dirt and some erosion blankets we got already. We'll just stick that in there. Hopefully we can get that done before winter too. So there are kind of the two biggies that we want to try to get done. Um, <coughs> we moved that, of course, the storage shed um, from the West Park that was the concession stand. We moved it up to behind the right, behind right field up at North One, um, right behind right field. Um, we're going to use that for storage um, as far as our uh, lime, our uh, uh, stuff that we use to soak up the water, plus all of our uh, chalk and stuff and our water reel and all the stuff that we use for maintenance on the fields. We'll be using that shed for that. And then for the future down the road, uh, we got it built in that if there for every chance there was ever a sprinkler system put in through our fire hydrant line there, uh, we can use that facility for our control, where all the controls will be inside the, the building to, to, to use that to get the, the field sprinkled. So it's kind of a nice deal. Um, Weather permitting, um, we got to uh, dig out behind North One ball field, kind of in the right center, uh, put in, start our batting cage foundation, um, which we bought from the joint ventures. Um, we've had that now for over a year, and I know I got a report on that here next month when I go to the joint ventures group. Probably wondering why it ain't done, but we've just been busy doing so much other stuff, so just haven't been able to get to it. Uh, we got to finish up winterizing the aquatic center. We got pretty much about 80% of it done. We just got to get some uh, antifreeze here and, and shoot that through the water lines underneath the deck and put it in the drains. But I think we got everything, uh, pretty much all everything out. All the sinks are tore out um, that way. We also have to blow out the water lines in the aquatic center on the uh, public restrooms, uh, the parks, and the picnic shelter and the concession stand. Probably do that next week. <coughs> and you got a compressor generator yeah. that does that. That does that. We'll we'll blow that all out and get that all winterized and stuff ready for the winter. Um, we got two signs on order from Abel's. Uh, one sign that says Veterans Memorial Park. That's the one we had at Lions 
Park and the one at East Diamond Park. Um, and we hope we can get them put in before it freezes up. If not, we uh, will store them and put them up in the spring. Um, but I, Abel's are in the process, and Chris is very, very busy because this time of year with the Amelia stuff and stuff. So, but uh, he's going to try to see if we can get them made. We did have the money for that, and we will purchase it, and they will be bought out of this budget. And then, uh, of course, I just said we got five loads of uh, line semi-truck loads of line to get put on the two ball fields at North Park. Uh, two loads at the West Park it's going to take to redo that infield and then one load at the Northeast. So we'll have five loads of doing that here too before we So other than that, we'll be busy. Yeah. And, uh, the mowing, whatever, still, still, we're still mowing. So um, hopefully we'll get done with that pretty soon after a hard frost. But um, busy. Any correspondence? Anybody? I can't think of anything. Uh, nope. Mm -hmm. All right. It was my mind, so. Okay. Well, do we have a motion to adjourn? Next meeting is? Is November 21st. That seems late in the month, but. Uh, it's the week of Thanksgiving, right? One, two, three. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm well, okay. It's a Tuesday meeting, so. I'm okay with it. I'm yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, because I think what we should do is make a decision on this pool thing and then we're on the light Next jacket meeting. and then we're done. Yeah. You know, everything yeah. is done with that. And then, um, yeah, it might be not too too long in the meeting, but we'll have a couple things on there. Talk about, uh, we got that True City USA application to get into and stuff like that. So, good. Okay. Right. I'll make a motion. I'll second it then. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Meeting turn, adjourned. Turn the recorder on. <laughs> Is this where we're supposed to turn that red right down? Everybody happy, maybe if well, we all agree with the six to eight. Then yeah.